So thank you so much, TJ, for, um, for what I'm sure is going to be a treat. Without further ado, over to you. Uh, look forward very much to the talk. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for uh, staying with us. Uh, it's really uh, a great event that uh, is organized every week. Uh, I've been enjoying it very much. Um, so uh, I was uh, told that uh, what's different about the Zoom uh, seminars is that uh, you know you want to clear top right corner of your screen so you can put maybe my video feed there. So I move my title of each slide to the left side. <laughs> see how, see how well it works. I also have this laser pointer. I want to make sure that it actually is visible. So do you see my laser pointer next to Akash? It is. And I next to the Center for the Physics of Living Cells, who actually uh, financed the work. OK. All right, so uh, this uh, talk uh, uh, we'll begin by some uh, background, uh, you know, DNA and mechanical code uh, hypothesis, and I review uh, the most relevant literature on sequence-dependent DNA mechanics. Then I briefly mention uh, some work done uh, in my own lab previously. And then mainly focus on uh, the work done by a really incredibly talented postdoc Akash Basu in the lab, where he developed a technology uh, uh, loop seek to study DNA mechanics on the genome scale, and then uh, trying to understand the mechanical code of the genome and the epigenome uh, involving DNA modifications, and I end with a brief uh, outlook. In our own uh, cells, uh, DNA is packaged into a chromatin and chromosome, uh, first into uh, what's called a nucleosome, uh, where protein core is wrapped around by uh, about 147 base pairs of the DNA, uh, forming close to two turns. And this is a really sharp uh, uh, prevent DNA, only 10 nanometers across in diameter. Uh, but this type of uh, high bending is also seen in many other uh, protein DNA structures. So it's very, very uh, ubiquitous in biology and life. And uh, it's and it's known to be sequence dependent on limited set of, uh, based on limited set of data. And the idea is that perhaps um, uh, during the evolution, sequence dependent DNA mechanics uh, may have played a role in con controlling DNA protein interactions and then uh, activities of many of the proteins that function on the DNA. So that is uh, you know, what people call the mechanical code hypothesis. And you know, can mutations uh, uh, act directly through changes in DNA mechanics. Uh, and if that's the case, then uh, evolution of the genetic uh, code and you know, code and choice and many other uh, uh, properties uh, could uh, have been dependent on the DNA, uh, sequence dependent DNA mechanics. And uh, to answer this question, we need actually uh, a lot of data, uh, many, many different sequences and measuring their DNA mechanical properties. So that is the topic of this talk. So briefly, uh, there is a really uh, important paper uh, about 40 years ago uh, by Buzz Baldwin's lab at Stanford University. They developed this uh, uh, DNA uh, uh, cycle formation or cyclization assay. We have a, sh a short piece of DNA with uh, sticky overhangs. And they eventually, they will anneal uh, to form a circle. You can stabilize this because overhangs are very short using an enzyme called the ligase uh, to stitch the gaps together to form a perfect circle. And the idea is that if the sequence makes the DNA more bendable, then uh, the two ends will come close to each other more frequently, increasing the chance of uh, uh, annealing and ligation. And this can uh, then be used as a measure of DNA flexibility or bendability or cyclizability, and how, however you want to uh, call it. So this has been a really popular technology. And, and then in com combination uh, with in vitro selection, uh, uh, people have then uh, produced uh, sequences that are highly cycli cyclizable. So you go through this process once and digest, uh, you know, remove uh, linear DNA from the pool. And you do this many, many times and eventually enriching for highly uh, cyclizable sequences. 
and look at the sequence uh, features of these molecules. And they find that uh, you see uh, uh, 10 base pair periodic occurrences of AATTTA dinucleotides. I mentioned what they are. Uh, and these are the features that are also found in uh, native uh, genomic sequences that are known to uh, position the nucleosomes uh, in well positioned uh, locations. So there's a nice crosstalk between orientation of the DNA around the nucleosome and also uh, 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 some of the repetitive dynamically sequences. So there's already a you know, well appreciated connection between DNA mechanics and uh, where the nucleosomes are kind of positioned in terms of angular positioning, not so much on uh, uh, translational positioning yet. So in my own lab, uh, previous two students uh, have uh, made some interesting observations using single molecule measurement. So Reza, shown here, he developed a single molecule looping or I cyclization experiment assay, where he tethers the DNA to a surface about 100 base pairs in length, and then uh, the overhangs are long enough so that once the two ends uh, are nail, uh, they stay on for a long time. Uh, so you don't have to use uh, proteins uh, to uh, do the experiment. And we also use a uh, thread between the dyes to measure this uh, time scale experimentally. And he found that this time scale to be dependent on the DNA sequence. And the idea is that if the looping occurs more quickly, quickly that a DNA sequence makes the DNA more bendable. Tui, uh, in uh, her work, uh, he com she combined optical tweezers and single molecule thread to apply force to the nucleosome ends and, and to measure thread uh, signal uh, caused by DNA unwrapping from the protein core. And she found that uh, if one side of the DNA is more bendable than the other, on the tension, the less bendable segment unwraps preferentially. And this is ni nice because, uh, uh, you know, due to the high bending of the DNA around the nucleosome, uh, it makes sense that more bendable sequence stays uh, wrapped on the protein core, even under high tension. So these measurements also suggest that uh, there's sequence dependent bendability and a connection to nucleosome stability under mechanical tension. Um, but, yes. TJ, quick question from Tom Chu. Why doesn't the fret recover to 100%? Oh, oh that's, uh, that's because uh, the we, uh, there are, I, I think in this case, we, uh, we don't score every looped molecule because of some defects in the, you know, the dial label is not complete and uh, not every molecule is in under perfectly, you know, uh, natural condition uh, when you tether them to the surface. So this is more or less, uh, close to the limit of uh, um, uh, our measurements. So then next questions are following. Well, what are the sequence features uh, that determine bendability? And for that, you need a lot of different sequences uh, and much beyond what you can do using single molecule experiments of one sequence at a time. And then uh, if uh, bendability is important for function, then in the present day genome, we should be able to find its signatures throughout the evolution. So this is where Akash comes in. He developed LoopSeq, uh, if you want DNA physics meets next-gen sequencing. So imagine having a large uh, library of DNA sequences, uh, thousands of sequences, but I'm showing only four sequences here, one to four, and each sequence has multiple copies in the library. And then you give them a minute to uh, form a loop. Um, and DNA1 that is most bendable will form circles readily, whereas uh, DNA4 that is least bendable will mostly stay linear. And then uh, after one minute of reaction, we use an enzyme uh, that digests the DNA, but only from the, the end. So this DNA sequence one is largely protected uh, because it doesn't have ends anymore and whereas sequence four will be mostly digested. So this actually uh, is a way to enrich for highly bendable sequences. So what you do is that we do uh, sequencing using next and sequencing eliminate machines, and then uh, you know, reads are normalized by the input. 
then, uh, then you can calculate the survival probability, which is highest for the most bendable sequence. And then you simply take the natural log of that as a measure of uh, flexibility, bendability, uh, T or slash cyclizability. So I'm using these terms interchangeably in this talk. So Akash uh, has uh, done this for lots of different sequences. And in fact, currently he has data from over uh, 250,000 different sequences of, of 50 base bits in length. So we have enough data sets to really try to get at the mechanical code of the genome. So what did he find? Uh, let me give you a brief introduction. Uh, here is a nucleosome, uh, DNA wrapped around the histone core. Actually, my students really printed this structure and then I spent about 10 hours of hand painting uh, uh, the DNA and the histone uh, proteins. So in the genome, uh, in budding yeast, definitely, uh, uh, where transcription starts here, there are, uh, you know, in addition to the nucleosomes, uh, plus one, that is the first uh, nucleosome encountered by uh, transcription machineries, and that plus two nucleosome and minus one. In between, uh, there is a region called NDR for nucleosome depleted region. And, and, and because the DNA uh, is sharply bent uh, in the nucleosome, if the DNA is more rigid uh, in NDR, one can uh, I predict that perhaps uh, that can be a reason for the formation of an NDR. So, for, but for that, we have to measure the rigidity or bendability of the DNA experimentally. So uh, Akash did that by uh, performing the loop seek of uh, 50 base pair DNA spanning uh, you know, 500 different genes uh, of, of 1,000 base pair region surrounding this region every seven base pairs. And by averaging over uh, loop seek data, uh, this is what he found. So uh, y axis is intrinsic cyclability, and x axis is a position from the plus one diode. And diode is actually uh, basically center of the DNA in a nucleosome uh, right here. And uh, so plus one uh, diode is actually first nucleosome. And he finds that uh, there is a nice uh, uh, dip uh, in uh, DNA bendability. That means the DNA is very rigid uh, right here. And this coincides exactly with uh, the region where uh, NDL uh, exists. This is uh, from a recent paper uh, by uh, Hennicock's lab. And nuclear occupancy shows a nice minimum right where we have a high DNA rigidity. Uh, this was really exciting because experimentally, we can actually show that DNA is indeed a rigid in NDR. And in some additional data we are not going to describe today, we think that it's not just the uh, energetics of DNA bending, but it's actually a uh, sensing of the rigid DNA by an enzyme that moves the nucleosome around along the genome that is responsible for establishing uh, uh, this nice uh, NDR. And there's actually really interesting in vitro biochemical data that Akash acquired uh, uh, to support this idea. Uh, TJ, another technical question. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask it right now from Navish Badho. Mm -hmm. How do you decide the DNA length to use in such an experiment? Um, so uh, we picked 50 base pair uh, DNA uh, because uh, we, you know, we think that we want to have about 100 base pairs uh, in a circle, but we also want to have uh, some shared sequences toward the end uh, so that uh, we can do like PCL or sequencing based uh, you know, required amplification. We also think that the center of that 100 base pair DNA is most important for in, in, in terms of de determining cyclization rate. So that, that is the reason. Great, thanks. So if you want, you, it's average, you know, whatever we de develop, determine here is a kind of average over that length scale. Thanks. So, so yes, so that's the point, uh, you know, DNA is indeed more rigid in NDRs. And then we can look at the sequence um, to try to decipher the mechanical code of the genome. So I'm drawing two strands of DNA uh, because single strand of DNA has a polarity of five prime to three prime. Uh, you know, we can put T, A, C, G, T as five bases here along the DNA strand and this uh, the other strand runs in opposite direction due to antiparallel nature of the DNA duplex and forming TA, AT, CG, GC, and TA base pairs. If you actually, uh, there's a terminology that we uh, use often, it's called dinucleotide. 
So here T and A along the same strand in the 5 prime to direction next to each other. So this is called a TA dinucleotide uh, or CG dinucleotide as shown here. We often use a, a jargon uh, called TPA or CPG because a backbone phosphate lies between the two base pairs, bases. So we can also call it CPG or TPA. Uh, interestingly, I, I mentioned, I'll get, get back to this later today. Uh, in higher organisms, including us, uh, cytosin C is methylated and mod modified chemically only uh, in the CPG context. Uh, you know, if there's a G next, next to it, you know, with some exceptions. So what we did was, uh, you know, we measured many, many different sequences. We asked this question, okay, if you look at 50 base pair sequences that have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, TPA or TA dinucleotides, what are their uh, average uh, bendability or cyclizability? It turns out if you have more of those, DNA becomes uh, more bendable as shown in the black line. In contrast, if you have more of those CPG dinucleotides, DNA becomes more uh, rigid. And these are pretty uh, strong effects uh, that just pop uh, out. But we can also do the same analysis for all possible dinucleotides uh, shown here. And we plot the slope of each curve. Again, C CPG, CG is the least bendable, negative slope, and TA is the most bendable with positive slope, but there everything in between. In fact, if you look at the sequences here, it's not just GC content. In fact, you know, CG is here, but GC is on the opposite side. So there's something that we didn't know uh, about these sequences that uh, determine uh, their contributions to DNA bendability. We can become more ambitious, we can look at uh, triple uh, of bases, trinucleotides, and see what uh, they look like. So these are all possible trinucleotides. Again, bendability quotients uh, from the fitting of the data to slow. So slow. And you can see that uh, there are highly rigid sequences, highly bendable sequences, and uh, many, uh, all of the CPG containing dinucleotides, they are more rigid than average, although with some spread and all of the TPA containing the uh, dinucleotides are uniformly uh, bendable. But notice that uh, three letters X a code for amino acids in terms of genetic code, you know, during translation. So we can also attach uh, a letter to each uh, tri triple nucleotides, uh, you know, R for arginine, S for serine, and so on, uh, encoding for amino acids. And it turns out, uh, you know, for amino acids that have multiple uh, synonymous codons such as arginine, you can see R is actually uh, all across the uh, range so that uh, if you want, you can actually choose a ba certain bendability contribution for an arginine without you know, changing the amino acid if you change the DNA sequence and so on. And there are many, many other examples. And uh, tryptophan W here shows up only once but its value is right in, in the smack in the middle uh, in the average. So the idea here is that genetic code has an intrinsic potential for optimizing local bendability without having to change the amino acids encoded by, by the DNA. And perhaps this uh, could uh, underlie uh, some of the uh, present day sequences. So that uh, idea- Sorry, TJ, Robin, did you have a burning question or one that can wait till the end? Um, I can wait to the end. Okay, TJ, back to you. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, then uh, next uh, is, you know, we now we actually have uh, enough data. I mean, in fact, uh, Akash uh, measure bendability across the entire chromosome, uh, chromosome five in Budding East. Uh, and he uh, uh, averaged over all of the nucleosomes in that chromosome, bendability across uh, the DNA sequence, uh, you know, around the center of the nucleosome or diet. And he finds that uh, DNA is more bendable in the middle and less bendable at the edges. And it makes sense because nucleosomes uh, next to each other are connected by a linker DNA of 20, 30 base pairs in budding yeast, and they don't have any selective pressure to be bendable, right? So it's more bendable in the middle and less bendable uh, in the edges. And in fact, uh, if you divide the data into different groups, that depending on how far the nucleosome is away from the transcription start site, you find that this uh, nice contrast is uh, 
essentially, uh, is especially pronounced if you look at uh, nucleosomes that are deep into the gene body, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 uh, nucleosomes. Um, that uh, is very striking um, uh, because uh, we didn't realize that uh, gene body nucleosomes are well positioned based on uh, other kinds of data. And so the next question is, you know, could you uh, have uh, achieved this uh, nice contrast in the gene body nucleosomes, um, you know, if you didn't care about the DNA mechanics uh, during evolution? So what uh, Kash did was he first measured the native sequences, uh, bendability contrast shown here experimentally, and then he randomized the codons, uh, but while preserving amino acid uh, encoded, and then um, generate this uh, sequence uh, library uh, experiment, you know, chemically, and then perform the experiment. You know, these are four different uh, randomized libraries, and they all show that this uh, nice contrast between the center and the edge of nucleosome disappears if you uh, randomize them. So this means that uh, during the evolution of the you know, codon choice, uh, nature must have cared about the DNA mechanics. So that was a really exciting uh, uh, moment uh, in his research. Now, uh, let me end uh, by uh, showing one slide about the mechanical code of the epigenome. Uh, I mentioned earlier that cytosine in higher organisms is methylated uh, in the CPG context and is generally a gene silencing mark, although with some exceptions. So what he did was uh, he had a uh, you know, large uh, set of sequences in a library and he used an enzyme to methylate all of the CPGs, uh, you know, uh, uh, context uh, cytosines using that enzyme. And then he performed uh, loop seek uh, with and without a methylation, and he plotted basically uh, uh, one against the other. And as you can see here, the red dots are the values uh, for all of the tetranucleotides containing at least one CPG in there are 50 base pairs. And uh, for this uh, red uh, dot, we see that once you methylate the DNA, all the dots uh, are now below Y equal X line, meaning that they all become uh, less bendable, more rigid upon methylation of the DNA, right? So this is a really general uh, phenomenon. And uh, we, we find that cyt cytosine methylation makes a DNA rigid in all uh, sequence context. What that implication is, uh, is still to be explored. Uh, it could be uh, changing nucleotide stability. It could be changing how the uh, RNA polymerase negotiates with the chromatin template and, and maybe chromatin modeling itself is changed. And, but really, uh, it's really uh, because our tissues uh, have different methylation patterns of the cytosine and, uh, and there is a uh, possibility that methylation can actually have an impact in how different tissues function through uh, changes in DNA mechanics. So that's something to be explored in the future. So let me summarize. Uh, I told you about uh, this idea that is in the field uh, that, that mechanical code may exist. And uh, we have a new assay, uh, LoopSeq, to measure DNA mechanics on a really large scale of many, many uh, different sequences. And our data suggests that sequence-dependent DNA mechanics can influence nucleosome organization from promoters until deep into the gene bodies. And it can influence establishment of the you know, NDRs and also evolution of the codon choice among the synonymous codons. And in terms of epigenetics, data suggests that methylation makes uh, DNA more rigid in all kinds of sequence context. In the future, uh, it'll be really great to see the connection between DNA mechanics and transcription, mechanics and replication and repair of DNA, and mechanics and uh, chromatin organization and chromatin remodeling and many other uh, transactions related to uh, chromatin. And there may also be important implications in uh, microbes and in viruses because uh, highly compact uh, DNA is also found in uh, in, in different uh, kingdoms of life. So uh, Akash was the hero uh, for this project, uh, really incredible guy. 
and Reza and Tui uh, were previous members of the lab who now have their own labs at Northwestern and uh, Oregon State, uh, Oregon Health uh, Science University. And we also uh, were assisted by uh, really talented colleagues uh, and collaborators who uh, helped us a lot in terms of formulation of the concept, essay development, and interpretation of the data uh, shown uh, here. And funding by NSF, NIH, and HHMI, especially uh, Center for the Living uh, Center for the Physics of Living Cells as, uh, at uh, in Urbana, uh, that uh, uh, has uh, uh, supported this work uh, uh, sustain uh, in a sustainable manner for several years. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, TJ. And you have many, many, many questions. So I'm going to read a selection now, and then we will transition into the informal chat. And thank you again to TJ and Jasmine for hanging out for the extra minutes. Um, so let me start by uh, asking a question from Omar Saleh at 1221. Can you reconstruct the triplet data in some way from the dinucleotide data, example, TAG equals TA plus AG, et cetera? Uh, we haven't tried that. Uh, but this is a really interesting question, Omar. Um, and I, I didn't have time to go into this, but it turns out uh, how these uh, dinucleotides are distributed pairwise is very important. And uh, for example, if you have AAA uh, 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 separated from another AAA by 10 or 20 base pairs or 15 or 25 base pairs, you have different effects. And that uh, that effect actually becomes more pronounced when you go from di to trinucleotides. But at the you know, original question he asked, um, can you get uh, the same data as, uh, can, can you get the same information about three based on two? Uh, the, the answer is actually no. <laughs> uh, I think there's just more information uh, there. In fact, we also have the same kind of data for four. And uh, there, then there are also some uh, new surprises that we didn't notice from uh, dinucleotides. Um, Sriram Ramaswamy at twelve seventeen. Could you say a little bit more about the about the sensing of bendability by the enzyme? Yes. Yeah, so in that experiment uh, that we have done with uh, collaborators in Germany, uh, Karl Peter Hofner, uh, we are using an enzyme called Eno eighty, and uh, it has a domain that uh, binds um, linker DNA, and uh, it turns out uh, if the linker DNA uh, is um, uh, rigid uh, or difficult to bend, then uh, the enzyme stops to work, right? So once, in, because the enzyme is pushing the, the uh, nucleosome into the NDR, but then if the uh, enzyme has a do enzyme domain, since the rigid DNA that cannot be bent, then it simply stops uh, working. So that is uh, our model and there's actually uh, some other data that support this, including unpublished uh, structural biological data. Um, so I'm going to take Nancy's question and then Robin's raise hand, and then we'll call it a close and then continue discussions in informal discussions. So Nancy's, Nancy Ford's question from 1222, interesting results regarding sequence dependent mechanics. This has been interpreted in terms of bending flexibility. How much does twist flexibility matter? So um, that is uh, a good point. And I think at this point, we cannot uh, uh, really fully distinguish between the bending versus twisting. And, and that's partially because when the DNA uh, form circle forms, uh, it will form it better if the phase matches better. And that will depend on the twist bendability. So uh, Akash has a plan in the future you know, uh, in his own lab uh, to, uh, uh, to use uh, a similar assay, but now twi uh, to measure specifically twist bendability. And that will have also important implications on the chromosome dynamics uh, on the physiological levels of uh, torsional stress. Cool. Uh, Robin, did you want to ask your question? Yes, please. Um, uh, thank you for the nice talk, Ted Jeep. Um, some years ago, Benjamin Widom published an extensive mechanical code for nucleosome positioning that wasn't based on mechanical experiments, but on, you might say, bioinformatics, where you look at the uh, 
how often uh, a particular um, DNA sequence is occupied by a nucleosome over different species. Have you tried to compare your library of bendability obtained from loop sequencing with uh, Jonathan Widdham's library obtained from bioinformatics? Um, so that is a, a very uh, good uh, question. So generally, the, the sequence-based rules are derived from uh, you know, basically what is the nucleus and positioning sequences, right? They, they, they are largely uh, determined by the GC content. And um, so in that sense, uh, our data uh, do not agree with that uh, because if you measure bendability of many sequences and plot it against the GC content, we see a flat line. Uh, GC content has uh, no, no effect uh, there. Um, so, uh, but on the other hand, you know, we, we see a correlation between bendability and the uh, nucleosome occupancy data measured uh, in vivo. So, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, and again, uh, Jonathan Williams' work, uh, did they, um, they didn't actually measure uh, DNA mechanics directly. They, they measured the positioning of the nucleosomes. Yes, um, but they did in the end come out with a library where they said certain sequences of DNA will have a certain affinity for nucleosomes. Mm -hmm. And you might look at how his library, you have a library which, you know, you actually described so nicely with Akash, for many different sequences. And I think it is very important to check the mechanical library versus the library which you obtain from- uh, Yes, so, so actually we, we, have, uh, we have the data. So we, have, we use the same, uh, actually, um, we-, uh, we, we um, A chicken embryo, I think, with them used. Yeah, so we, ha we, have, uh, we have data where we, uh, put the sequences in the, in the middle of the nucleosome forming sequences and measure the bend, uh, nucleosome formation and uh, compare to bendability. Yes, there is a correlation in that case. Um, uh, not, not a very strong one, uh, but maybe uh, 0.3 in terms of PCC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But isn't that, isn't that surprising? Shouldn't you expect that to be the same? Um, if there is such a discrepancy, that yeah. sounds like this is a serious problem. Um, so, Robin, can I ask you to hold that thought while we officially close the seminar, and then we okay. can uh, we can have it out in the informal discussions. Okay. Does it sound reasonable? Sounds good. All right. Thank you all for being absolute champs with today's extra special edition of the BPPV seminar series. Special thanks to Jasmine and TJ. We are officially ending the seminar, but please hang out with us if you have the time, and uh, we can start informal discussions.